This idea, thank you, Jeremy, I can hear you. <laughs> this idea that politics is all about charisma and spin is rubbish. It is trust that matters. Yeah. And it's with those words that I would like to introduce you to Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of the Labour Party. Thank you, thank you very much all of you for coming here this afternoon and BC thank you for that introduction and as a very old friend you immediately told me off for speaking behind you while you were introducing me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I've known BC for a very long time and I've got huge respect and affection for her. She's somebody that always fights the fight however difficult or easy it is. She is there standing up for the principles that matter in our society. BC, thank you, not just for today, but for all the other days. We're taking this campaign all over the country, and I think I'm right in saying this is the 22nd event we've done since this leadership campaign begun. It's the third rally we've done in 18 hours. We are very busy all over the country. And we're holding events, public events, in all parts of the country, be they what are termed Labour strongholds or places that have yet to become Labour strongholds. <laughs> there are no no-go areas for us. And when we held a rally in Cornwall ten days ago, somebody said, what on earth are you going to Cornwall for? And I said, not just because it's there, but because it is part of this country, because it is the low pay capital of this country, because there is deep poverty in those chocolate box covered villages, and because there are people there that want to be part of this whole movement. And you know what? There are 4,000 Labour Party members in Cornwall, and a thousand people came to our rally on a Saturday afternoon. So we are taking this campaign everywhere and I'm really pleased to be sharing a platform with all of my colleagues behind me. To Anne I want to say thank you very much for what you said, the way you put it and the work that you do. We spent a very interesting afternoon discussing the way food banks operate and the people that have to use food banks. At one level, thank you to all those people that support them, thank you to all those volunteers that help to keep them going. But another level, why in 21st century Britain do a million people use food banks every year? That has to be the question. And with all the difficulties and problems you're getting from the Tory government and its treatment of your council, you managed to build that wonderful new library in Hena. I really enjoyed visiting that and I enjoyed the safe havens you're offering to people all over the county who are going through a crisis, a time of stress, somewhere to go, somebody to help you. Surely it's those principles behind the way that you make public decisions which separates us from the party in government that only knows about wealth up here and poverty down here that doesn't care about the services that are necessary for the people in the middle. Surely it is the point of principles that we offer that is so important. A year ago, we lost the general election. And as Andy was pointing out, we lost that general election not because some of the policies we were offering were bad, they weren't, they were very good, the policies on zero hours contract, the policy on housing development and on the NHS was stuff that I strongly supported. But the fundamental problem was this. This country went through a crisis, the banking crisis, 
of 2008-9, brought about by a subprime mortgage crisis in the USA, a contagion that spread around the world, a contagion of greed and underregulated banks that made themselves safe at the expense of everybody else. And so when they spend their time blaming all of you and all of us for the banking crisis, as Andy pointed out, was that banking crisis created by care workers, by pensioners, by nursery aged children? Was it created by doctors? Was it created by anyone working in the public sector? Or was it created by a lack of regulation of a financial system that forced us to protect them to the tune of 300 billion pounds and then institute an economic strategy of political choice of forcing austerity on the rest of us. And if you, as I've explained at other rallies, if you took a map of modern Britain and you put a red mark or a red colour over every area where there is low pay, deep poverty, insufficiency of housing, long hospital waiting lists, shorter life expectancy, children growing up in poverty, insecure housing where children are moving school every few months because their landlord evicts them because they can't afford to pay the rent and they have to go somewhere else. If you coloured all those areas red, then you did another map to overlay above that the areas that have had the greatest cuts in local authority expenditure, expenditure which helps to support adult social care, that supports the care necessary, that supports all those services that are so important. The areas that have received the biggest cuts are exactly the same. They've cut from the areas that need help. They've given to the areas that already have the most. So Derbyshire doing its best to provide the best education and opportunities they can. Derbyshire doing its best to provide libraries that people need, receives the cuts, other places don't. That is what's so fundamentally wrong. And so after the election, I thought things had to change. Because in that election campaign, we were offering a form of austerity light. We were gonna continue with the public sector pay freeze. In effect, a public sector pay cut. It sounds all very academic and quite easy to do. The minister gets up in parliament and says, well, we're going to freeze public sector wages for another five years. We think it's a reasonable thing to do. It's a price that's got to be paid. It's perfectly okay. Let's get on with that. And then they go on to say, and uh, moreover, the public sector has got to be prepared to play its part in dealing with austerity. Okay, all right, thank you. Then they move on and say, what we have to do is provide an incentive. An incentive by cutting corporation tax to the very biggest corporations, and we have to reduce income tax for the very richest to 45 pence, or maybe even lower, to encourage them to pay their tax in this country. This is a very strange concept that apparently for the highest earners and the highest income tax payers, tax is a kind of voluntary arrangement. Saying, well, yes, I don't mind helping out the public sector. I'll pay a little bit of tax. And, um, I, won't put, I, I won't put everything into the Cayman Islands this year. I'll try and help people out. And by the way, can I have tax relief on my charitable donations? But for the rest of you, my goodness, you owe 500 pounds to Inland Revenue, HMRC, they're on to your case straight away. Okay, well, let's look at it a different way. They chose, and John has explained this, John McDonnell explained this very well, they have made austerity the political choice, not the economic necessity. If we carry on with this process of austerity, of cutting public expenditure and public services, loading more onto the poorest in our society, taking away the supposed burden from the very wealthiest in our society, what then happens? I'll tell you what happens. More and more children end up living in deep poverty because there is no council housing for them to move into. 
they remain in the private rented sector, largely unregulated, insecure tenancies, and they have a problem in staying in school, they have a problem in achievement in school, they often have a problem in health. We shortchange a whole generation of children. And then those that have um, had complex problems in their lives, what happens? You go to parks in major cities at night, go there summertime, eight, nine o'clock at night, when the rest of us have enjoyed visiting the beautiful park, a beautiful park like this, enjoyed it. We're leaving, we're going home. There are other people that are going into the park at night, trying to find a park bench to sleep on, trying to find a shelter in which to survive. You go to a major railway station in any of our big cities, you find homeless people sleeping on the station, trying to get by and trying to survive. You talk to them, they've all got different stories. It's about being intentionally homeless, it's about family breakup, it's about mental health conditions. It's a whole variety of things. But what is it about modern Britain that we anaesthetize ourselves to the consequences of underfunding the public realm and public investment, which leads to these levels of inequality within our society? I'm sorry, sorry to say that a year ago, just over a year ago, in Parliament, we were being told that since the Tories had won the general election, they'd obviously won the argument on welfare, and it was okay to call anyone who was legitimately accessing the benefits to which they're entitled, that somehow or other, the language of the Murdoch press, of Scrounger and all the rest of it, was legitimate. And we then were going to abstain on a welfare reform bill which took 12 billion pounds out of the pockets of the poorest and most vulnerable within our society. Well, I tell you this, when we fought the leadership campaign last year, it was fundamentally about saying we are going to offer a different economic program. And I'm very proud of the work that John McDonnell has done in offering that different economic program <laughs> that challenges the austerity agenda. Now, it isn't just about paying out benefits and paying out. It's also about the kind of economy we want. Do we want to become a sort of bargain basement island on the shores of Europe where there are grotesque levels of inequality, low levels of taxation at the top end, corporate and for the very wealthy, and insufficiency of services at the other end? Or do we instead want to invest in an economy that works for all? Invest in education, invest in good quality training and apprenticeships for young people, invest in high-tech, sustainable manufacturing industry, a national investment bank of 500 billion pounds to deal with the issues of infrastructure, deal with the issues of housing, and deal with the issues of economic development. So we have a growing economy that does provide work and opportunities for particularly unemployed or underemployed young people. We can do things differently if we have a mindset that includes everybody within our society. And that is what we're trying to put forward. But it's also about the world of work and what it's like. And so we've established something called Workplace 2020, which is being led by Ian Lavery MP, that Workplace 2020 is to take advice and evidence from trade unions, from members of trade unions, from people in work, about their rights at work, about their security in work, about their aspirations in work, and also take evidence from the self-employed. There's a very large number of self-employed people in this country who can be just as much exploited as people in work by unscrupulous people that contract them to do things. So there's a lot of issues there. But there's a number that absolutely stand out. One is, let's get rid of, once and for all, as 18 other countries in Europe have done, the whole idea of zero-hours contracts, where, <laughs> where somebody doesn't know what their income is going to be from one um, income is going to be from one week to the next. No, no ability to plan anything, no security whatsoever. It can be done. And when you look at the levels of deregulation, 
Look at the report by the Parliamentary Select Committee on Sport Direct. Look at the Parliamentary Select Committee report on BHS and what it's done. And you see a bit of a pattern there, don't you? You see a bit of a pattern there by the owners of companies that seem to glory in uh, the accommodation offered to them by tax havens, in the case of Philip Green. And in the case of Mike Ashley, he seemed to glory in the idea that you can endlessly subcontract work to one agency after another after another and pretend it's nothing to do with you. And so that Sport Direct at Shirebrook ends up not paying the minimum wage, calling ambulances and fire tenders all the time as those workers have zero hours contracts, unsafe working conditions and are now being forced to pay some of the back pay they should have paid all these years. Now, would that have happened without the work of Unite the Union and others in exposing it? So don't we need positive rights at work, positive rights to representation against unscrupulous employers like that? And that is one of the issues that we're going to be offering absolutely clearly. Because when you go down the road of denying representation, deregulating, then you end up with lower wages, worse working conditions, high turnover of staff. It's not a happy or a very successful company in which to be in. And so we're taking evidence on this. So come the general election, whenever it's going to be, we're not going to start consulting then on how we would do these things because the consultation is on now so that everyone, everyone who's got an idea, good, good idea, different idea, different way of doing things, Put those views forward so we can take them all on board. It's called democratic policy making, and that's what I want to see in the Labour Party. And we now have more than half a million members to do that. And so in one year, 300,000 people have joined the Labour Party. They joined for a reason. They want to see a different society and a different way of doing things. Look at the other great issues that people are facing. Housing. There's a housing crisis in Britain like there's never been before. We're building fewer houses than we built since the 1920s. We have a government that thinks council housing is something that should be sold off um, if it's a valuable property, should be rationed for everybody else, and uh, no local authority should be given any support in building council housing. A private rented sector that they do not believe should be regulated. Indeed, when Labour MP Theresa Pearce, on behalf of our front bench, moved an amendment to the housing bill to say, it actually was very simple, I couldn't imagine anyone would oppose it. It simply said, any home that's put out for rent on the private rented market must be fit for human habitation. It doesn't seem very extreme to me too extreme for this government, too extreme for the free marketeers, they voted it down. The idea you would have to say it's got to be fit for human habitation was too much for them. Well, this government's very bad, I agree. Um, <laughs> the issue has to be addressed in a different way. We have to build council housing, half a million homes over five years that can deal with the housing crisis. We have to take the shackles off local government that's been forced to sell the high value properties because that helps to create a sense of community cohesion and there has to be, as I said, lifetime tenancies. Now people say, well, that's going to cost a lot of money. Yeah, absolutely, it's going to cost a lot of money. I call it investment. I would rather put public money into building bricks and mortar that provides good homes for people that creates jobs in the building industry, jobs in the supply chain, becomes an economic growth, rather than maintaining an insufficiency of council housing, very expensive and largely unregulated private rented sector, which is then subsidised through a housing benefit system, a lot of which goes to the private landlords. Better to put the money in housing rather than in those subsidies. So that then becomes a generator and also helps the health and well-being of all of our young people because they're obviously the future, obviously very important. And issues of ill health are something that we all feel very strongly about. I'll just say this about that. 
our party in 1948 founded the National Health Service. Free health service, free at the point of use as a human right for everybody. And there's something quite um, emotional when you go to a maternity ward and you meet a baby for the first time, somebody, a relative, friend or whatever, who's had a baby. The first thing that child gets is their NHS number, their guarantee of health care for the rest of their life. There's something very special about that. That didn't happen by accident. It happened because of the inspiration of those that wanted a health service free at the point of use as a human right. And even the Tories don't dare say they want to abolish the National Health Service, but they recognise a number of things. One is, it costs a lot of money, of course it does. They also recognise it's a huge market opportunity, of course it is, or could be, or is at the moment. So they introduced the Health and Social Care Act in the last Parliament, which requires the privatisation of 49% of our services. Sadly, we made, and I opposed it at the time, mistakes by bringing private finance into the NHS, which has become a dead weight, a lead weight on the administration of every hospital. I want an NHS that is universal, free at the point of use and properly funded. Because if we don't have that, we will end up with a continuous underfunding of our NHS, a rationing of the most expensive medicines, and gradually those that can afford it will move into the um, private health care field and instead of being a health service free at the point of use as the universal port of call for all of us it will become a health service of last resort for those who can't afford to go somewhere else look what's happened to those states in the usa that brought in a more universal form of health care in the past and it's gradually diminished protect the nhs it is very vital for all of us the NHS has to cope with a lot. It obviously has to cope with all the illnesses and so on we have and the stress levels that are there at the moment through underfunding, the stress levels of A&E doctors and nurses when there's insufficient staff, there's a huge queue of people waiting to be treated. That has to be dealt with. And so instead of abusing and opposing the junior doctors, why can't we have a Secretary of State for Health who recognises the junior doctors are supporting the NHS, want the NHS, are dedicated to the NHS, they're the lifeblood of the NHS. And the other area is of course that of mental health. There are a goodly number of us here today in our lifetime. Many of us will suffer stress. We'll know people who suffer stress will go through some form of mental health crisis. Two things. One is, let's be strong enough to use language of support and care for people going through stress, not make jokes about it, not be abusive about it. And have NHS mental health care that is sufficient and good for everyone to gain access to it when they need it because too many people don't get the help and support they need when they need it and often end up in a very bad place as a result of it. Stress is caused by many factors in society. The NHS obviously has to do its best to deal with that but it's up to us, the rest of us, to try to create that society that invests in the good of all, that doesn't allow anyone to be left behind that also creates a better and fairer society as a result of it. Poverty is a terrible thing. Poverty is a terrible waste in lots of ways. So if a child growing up in poverty ends up underachieving in school, ends up in bad health, ends up not getting to college, ends up not getting an apprenticeship, ends up not going to university, is it because they uh, weren't capable of it or is it because we as a community couldn't provide the opportunities for them? And do you know what happens then? If somebody doesn't become that brilliant engineer, that teacher, that doctor, that nurse, that lawyer, whatever else it is they aspired to be, they lose out and we all lose out because we've lost the opportunity of another member of our community to be educated. Can't we approach 
the whole issue on the basis of the opportunities and inclusion for everybody. So why are we saddling today's generation of students with debts of 50 and 60 thousand pounds at the end of their degree course? In Germany, they treat education as a value to the whole community and don't charge student fees. We have gone down the road in this country of pricing another generation out of university education by lifting the cap on fees. So when Theresa May stood on the steps of Downing Street and said she was concerned about inequality in Britain, I agree, I'm very concerned about inequality in Britain, so are we. So why the next day introduce a, another education bill which lifts the cap on student fees and will in effect deny university education to another generation because they can't countenance the level of debt they're going to be left with. Can't we invest in our young people, invest in older people and treat education as a right and a good for all of us, not a commodity to be bought and sold? So there are so many issues that we have to take forward in what we achieve. It's about rights at work. It's about the way people are treated in work. It's about investment in our society. It's about education. It's about health. It's about housing. It's about our natural world and our environment and our place in the natural world and the environment. I want a Labour government, desperately, that will sign up to all of the environmental protocols around the world, but will play our part in reducing and ending levels of pollution and will invest in green energy and green energy jobs in Britain. These things can be achieved. You can't do it on your own. If we put polluted air up in the sky, it's going to blow somewhere. There's lots of winds and they blow lots of places. It'll end up in somebody else's backyard. Likewise, if a country across the seas pours raw sewage into the sea, it'll end up here. If you throw plastic bags in the sea, they could end up anywhere. Look at that island of plastic bags that's floating around the Pacific, killing fish and killing the ecosystem. It's an attitude of mind, both to our own local natural world and environment, our national natural world and environment, but it's also about how we deal with other countries. If we have tough environmental control regulations here, and we do, and I'm glad about that, if we don't impose those same regulation on goods that we import, in effect, we're exporting the pollution somewhere else. It's an attitude of mind towards our respect for the natural world and the whole planet. So these things are not easy to deal with. I'm not pretending they are. They're very difficult to deal with. But you have to have a mindset that wants to address those issues. And when we're dealing with international issues, I... Um, opposed the Iraq war very strongly in 2003, not because, not because I was any supporter or sympathizer or apologist for Saddam Hussein and his regime. Indeed, I was one of a very small number of people that were opposing arms sales to Iraq in the 1980s. You've got to think very carefully about the consequences of this. So I want a international strategy and policy that is directed towards international law, that is directed towards adherence to both the international and European Convention on Human Rights. And stop treating human rights as some sort of joke that fills up the columns of some of our newspapers and start saying in our schools and everywhere else, a human right is the right to do what we're doing now, having a public meeting in a park. It is the right to representation. It's a right to say what you think even if others don't agree with you in doing that. It's a right to practice your faith and practice your religion. It's a right to live in a society of strength in its diversity. That surely is how we bring people together. You can say and look at the problems that we have in many parts of the country on health, on housing, on education, work. There are lots of issues and you can blame your neighbor. You could blame your neighbour because they're a different nationality, they're a different ethnic group. You could blame your neighbour for all kinds of things. And you know what? Your neighbour might start blaming you. Then you might get together and blame the one two doors down. You might end up with a fine old fiesta of blaming each other for everything else. It wouldn't actually change anything. It wouldn't actually 
develop one school, one hospital, train one nurse, one teacher, one doctor, or make any child better off. The only thing you can do is to look at the levels of underfunding of what we need and get together as communities to demand what we deserve and should get to fund our communities. When you do things together, people are very much stronger and they do achieve things. When you divide yourselves apart, you don't achieve anything at all. It's how we approach, how we approach each other and approach this world that is so important. And so, at one level, this is a campaign about the leadership of a political party and of the opposition. It's also about how we do politics in our society. I'm very proud of the number of people that have joined the Labour Party, affiliated to the party through trade unions or joined and registered as supporters. It's fantastic to have so many people actively involved in politics. So many young people getting involved in politics for the first time, so many others become, coming back in because they can see a value and a point in doing it. So on September the 24th, there's going to be a result of this election. We go back into Parliament. Let's go back into Parliament that day or that following week and take it straight to the Tories. We want housing. We want schools. We want hospitals. We want a dedication towards greater justice and equality within our society. And we can do that. And we can do that and gain a lot of support because the appeal of all the things that I've set out today, all the things that we have set out in the 10 points we're putting forward in this election campaign actually affects everybody within our society. People who feel they're well off, nice house, nice job, good security, they still need a National Health Service. They're still unhappy about levels of inequality. They're still uneasy when finding there are so many people homeless and destitute within our society. They don't want to live in that kind of world. And they are prepared to take part in a society that brings about real equality, real social justice for everybody in our society. If we go down the road of low tax at the top, underfunding at the other end of the scale, then we end up with greater levels of inequality, greater levels of injustice, greater levels of unease throughout our society. If instead we invest and support each other, if instead we recognise the common good of coming together, yes on all the practical services I've mentioned, but also the artistic services, the cultural expressions of people, the idea that all of us have some degree of artistic and cultural talent within us. You create a stronger and more cohesive society and you give hope and inspiration to the next generation coming along. So quite simply, it's like this. We want to create a society where nobody is left behind, where no community is left behind, where no group is left behind, where no part of this country is left behind. That's why we're taking the campaign to every part of the UK. This is at one level, as I said, an election to the leader of the party, but it's also a preparation for a general election campaign to carry that same strong message of cohesion and what we can achieve as a society. So, thank you so much for being here today in Matlock. Thank you for your support. Thank you for your friendship and thank you for your sense of unity of what we together can achieve. Thank you very much.